Welcome back to Authentic on Air with Bruce Alexander. I'm your host, Bruce Alexander. I am here with a special guest today, Bales Chaples, who I am so happy I said her name right. Uh, Bales is here from the Oklahoma Department of Some Kind of Health, and she has got a lot of resources that we're going to talk about and get into. Um, Bales is one of our neurodivergent kin, and I'm super excited to explore the intersection between neurodiversity and authenticity with her. I'm sorry, with them, because they have had an interesting story so far, and I'm really excited to get more into it and share it with you all. So welcome, Bales. Hi, thank you so much for having me on, Bruce. I'm so excited to chat with you guys. So the first question I want to get out there, just jump right in, is what does it mean to be authentic to you? Oh, goodness. What does it mean to be authentic to me? Um, It means behaving in a way that lets me love myself really, really well. Mm. What does um, that look like in your in your world? Well, it looks like being very aware of what my needs are and what my capacity is and then accommodating for that. Um, in my professional life, in my personal life, in all of the other aspects of my life. So I know that you're neurodivergent. Would you mind sharing what your neurodivergent status is with our audience? Not at all. So I am ADHD and autistic. And when did you get your diagnoses? So it uh, would have been, oh goodness, 2022, thereabouts. Um, I had the benefit of health insurance, which was uh, a boon. And I ended up uh, seeking the diagnoses um, because I needed to get through grad school and I was uh, suffering and I was like, hey, possibly there are medications that will help you do this. So you, you say you were seeking the diagnosis. What made you think that you needed the diagnosis? Like, did you know that already that you were ADHD or autistic and you just needed the official stamp? I mean, yes, there are only so many things that could be. And when you are a person who works in a behavioral health field, uh, when you're a person who works extensively in mental health, when you live around people who are ADHD and autistic, um, you're like, wow, I just thought I did that because I was fun, funky and special. You mean everybody can't hear like the fluorescent lights all the time? Is like, I thought this was an everybody thing. Are you mm. telling me I need to see a doctor? And it turns out, no, that was not an everybody thing. So we, we talked a little bit before about you kind of navigating your early life and, you know, you were a high achiever uh, and, you know, especially in my, the stories I've heard with ADHD and autistic women is when they're high achievers, it largely goes unrecognized, untreated at the autism and ADHD because of there being no like hyperactivity. You know, you don't you don't get the same complaints of like, like I got all the time. He's a distraction, like he's not applying himself, even though I made straight A's and I was at the top of my class. I wasn't just quiet. So what was it like to navigate? you know, that early childhood, you know, in the earlier years in high school, as you're struggling to, to kind of get to know yourself? Oh, gosh, it was not fun. Zero out of 10 stars would not recommend doing it again. Uh, actually, if I got to pick. Um, but no, so you're right. Um, for people who um, are assigned female at birth, um, and are femme presenting, it was not a thing that was, um, realized uh, my lack of social skills was compensated for by the fact that I was intelligent and smart people don't have to have good manners because they're smart. Um, it was accommodated for by the fact that I was like in so many extracurriculars, I didn't have time to form social connections that were like true meaningful things. Uh, the ADHD was a help when it allowed me to do multiple things in a day and to have all of these different extracurriculars. Um, the hallmarks of autism are abnormal development. And a lot of people tend to think that that goes uh, the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of developmental ability. 
uh, but you don't consider precocious development as like a hallmark or a counter. You're just really smart and exceptional. Um, so if you do find yourself in need of assistance, if you're like, wow, I'm really overwhelmed, it's not a thing that you are offered help about. It's like, well, you're exceptional, so you should just push through it. Um, and like being taught to minimize and mask any of your discomfort all the time, both from like a I exist in a female shaped body context and in like a you are expected to mask your neurodivergencies because they make other people uncomfortable format. So like um, I didn't address this and I feel like I, I, uh, I misgendered you in that statement. I, I'm definitely new to these conversations. Like I'm aware of all the stuff that exists, but I don't have anybody in my life that is, that is currently, you know, fighting that battle. So this is something that I'm totally open to, you know, you giving me criticism on and letting me know whenever I use the wrong gender, because it's something that like, I like to respect the, the space that people want to exist in. Like that is, that's my whole thing. It's like show and up I, as you and I'll do what I can to, you know, to accommodate. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not super pressed about it in my professional life. I usually let folks assume she, her, because it's easier and I have other battles to fight. Um, and part of authenticity for me is knowing when and where it's the most efficient to show up fully as myself. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about safety. I live in Oklahoma. It is a wild place to be a non-binary human or to be trans or to be queer of any stripe. Um, so you, you pick your battles carefully. I appreciate how willing you are to learn and to accommodate me, like genuinely. Well, I, you know, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate you, you know, sharing your story and being honest because these are the kinds of conversations that allow those who are on the fence between being open and learning more to keep learning more versus, you know, contracting. It's like, I'd rather help people expand by having, being the one who has the uncomfortable conversation, like whatever, I'll be that guy. I'm willing to throw myself under the bus to make sure that, that we all learn more and we all show up, you know, as a, as a more accepting society. So, um, in that, mm -hmm. you talked about the you know showing up in a female shaped body. When did when did you start to have that that question come across of am I a woman or am I something different? And what was the what do you feel like the the seasoning that your autism and your ADHD added to that mix? Oh my goodness! So they're very very interconnected because. Um, everyone I've talked to kind of feels like they're doing woman badly. And it's in fact kind of a hallmark of womanhood. And I wasn't growing up. I knew that I did not fit into like the prescribed box. It constantly felt like I was doing things wrong or incorrectly. And it's very hard to distinguish between is this a gender thing or am I just being really, really autistic about it for that social cue? Because so much of gender is comprised of how we interact with society around us, mm -hmm. which there is a significantly higher percentage of gender non-conforming people who are autistic, who are neurodiverse. And like those two things frequently intersect. I wouldn't call them comorbid because that's not like the vibe that I'm going for, but right. frequently they overlap. And it's because you normally have like a little bit of a weirder time figuring out what your own social cues and social responses and social interactions are. Um, am I interacting in this strangely and feeling uncomfortable because it's an autism thing? Or is it because the prescribed roles of womanhood don't fit and don't correctly mesh with who I am? Mm. And it took a long time to figure that out. I figured out I was non-binary before I figured out I was autistic. Um, and it's entirely because I had the language for that experience first. Right. So here's a question. Um, this is, you know, this might be too personal. Let me know if I'm, if I'm off base here. It's, well, let, I've got two different questions. I'm trying to decide which one to go with. First one is if you feel like you were doing woman badly, is there a possibility that maybe just our definition of what woman is, is too narrow? Or is it that you are something, you know, that there has to be something different? 
So, yes and. Mm. Um, it is it is a both question. Like, very much so our definition of what woman is, is very, very narrow and incredibly prescribed. And the idea that there is a way to do woman badly is like a silly thing because the only thing it takes for you to be a woman is to be like, yo, I'm a woman and this is how I choose to interact with the world. And this is like how I mesh and like the concept of woman, even across genders or not genders, excuse me, across cultures is so wildly different. The things that you do that are masculine hallmarks over here are feminine hallmarks over here. And the only difference is you crossed a geographical span. Mm -hmm. So yes, the idea of what woman is, is very, very narrow. And like, I think the thing for me, and I think that this is pretty common for a lot of my trans siblings. Um, there are a lot of people who will define the idea and the concept of being trans as like a response to discomfort and to dysphoria. And I find that that's an incredibly limiting thing to have your baseline be and your, your uh, benchmark, because I wouldn't want to be defined by pain in general, in struggle. Right. The real definition and the real test of it is euphoria. So gender euphoria. I never felt anything more than resigned, kind of, about womanhood and like mm. all of the trappings with it. I feel incredible euphoric joy around the idea of being non-binary and not being tied to one thing. Mm. And it's the flexibility that's important. My gender is the change, not necessarily any static point. Oh, that was, that was a bar like that. I really like my, my gender is the change. It is not a static point. That is something that I've never considered before as you know, like I, I think that, Gender fluidity is something that I kind of, uh, gender and sexual fluidity is something that I was able to kind of understand much earlier than I could understand what it meant to be trans. Like I just, I couldn't yeah. really, cause it's not my, it's not my experience. I don't have it at all. And I don't, like I said, I don't have anybody in my life to really have those conversations with. So I, but it's like, I understood like, especially being sexually fluid. Like I am a, I am a cisgendered male. Like I get that life very much but i've always been able to say that's an attractive guy like mm -hmm. and and having that ability to like slide even just slide that much in the fluidity opened me up to being able to understand how maybe it's not so specific mm -hmm. maybe it's not really just either or exactly and so i think that that the way that you you know really just stated that succinctly helps me like tie that and you know really make it make sense in my head so but here's here's the other question that, that i often think about is that if you don't you don't identify with you know with womanhood does that and and the idea of thinking of it as a as the body of a woman does that mean that you don't enjoy your womanly parts does you don't want to be seen like i see a, a woman's body and i am often like oh woman woman things i like those and you know part of that is my own hypersexualization you know objectifying women that i struggle with but I want to know, like, is that something that is that you find joy in your body once you're able to uncouple the the gender norms from what this body means? Or is is it always entrenched in what womanhood is to have breasts and to have a vagina? So. Yes and no. Um, there are people who are trans who experience high amounts of body dysmorphia, um, and that's what it's called. Uh, you're feeling dysphoric. And there are days when I wake up and I'm like, oh, this doesn't fit at all. Um, it's like wearing a pair of really, really uncomfortable shoes that are like a size too tight. Mm. Um, and there's not a lot you can do with that because it's like, well, th this is the form I have right now. And I think if I were like binary trans, it might be a little bit easier to put like a pin on that specific thing because there are people who um are trans women trans men they would like to do the full physical transformation and that's a thing that brings them comfort and brings them ease there's a demonstrable process that goes through and you see the mental health outcomes from allowing people uh, to fully medically transition if that's their choice 
Um, personally for me, I think that it would be kind of a lot of expense to do a bunch of physical changes for a thing that's not static anyway. Like mm -hmm. the ideal would probably be like shape shifting if that's ever a thing or like those neat mecha parts like for robots. But uh, that's not a thing that's happening right now. And it's a, another part that goes in with like body acceptance in general. So I'm actually in active recovery for an eating disorder mm -hmm. currently. So um, anorexia girlies represent. Th thank you for being vulnerable <laughs> and sharing that. Like that's. I mean, yeah. So it's hard to separate. Do I hate my body because I have this thing? Do I hate my body because it doesn't fit my gender at the moment? Or do I hate my body because, like, I exist with chronic pain and it's just kind of uncomfortable in general? So it's like a whole nexus of things. Um, I find that the best way around it is body neutrality rather than body positivity. Mm -hmm. Like, regardless of how I feel about it, this body is mine. And um, it does wonderful things for me. It's got good hands. Uh, for grabbing and for crafting and for all sorts of other things. Uh, like, these are my arms. We we do good things together. My legs walk me places and it is mine. It's a tool that I have. Um, and while I am not my body, my body is mine. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it, it guides me to another question. So I, I'm a parent of four children. We homeschool, but there's <laughs> there's there's a lot of things happening in the public schools right now that that I'm concerned about for other kids like my my children won't have to face it and to me it is not like the the transgendered population like popping up in schools is not the problem to me the problem is the fact that there is such a high um importance put on gender at all in schooling and I, I was wondering what your take is on that like to me we don't talk about how important it is to be like oh you know you got to be a uh, you know, a sharp dressed little boy. So all the girls like you, or, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, um, I remember hearing things like, uh, boys don't like mean girls, like those types of things in school. And to me, like that is disgusting. Like schooling is supposed to be about, you know, learning who you are outside of all of that stuff. And I'm curious as to being somebody who is out of the schooling system, but is close enough to have, you know, 10 years ago, you were deeply, you know, entrenched in it. And then also having the the trans part of it, what 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 does that sound like to you? Am I am I crazy in thinking that maybe there seems to be less gender in school? Period. So you're not crazy, but I think I would take the opposite tack. The response to this should not be no gender expression at all, because while you're in school, one of the things that you're learning is like social skills. It's how you interact and interface with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and part of showing up authentically is learning how to interact with your peers in a way that is yourself. It's supposed to be a time where you have space to figure things out, where you have space to learn who you are as a person. And part of learning who you are as a person is learning and internalizing your gender. And some people who are cis, it's not a thing that has to cross their mind. They don't have any inciting things. I personally think that more cis people should think about their gender and whether or not it's a thing that makes them happy. Because mm. I think everybody deserves that. But in schools, like, the issue is not gender. The issue is, in fact, patriarchy. And when you emphasize these things, and when you heavily emphasize gender roles, when you say, well, you have to be masculine, well, you have to be feminine, instead of letting like the full expression of human development flourish, like you're tramping down on everybody who doesn't fit into these very, very rigid boxes mm -hmm. of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. Um, so instead of being like, well, less gender in general, you should encourage full gender expression like wow it is great that you are choosing to explore in this way wow it is fantastic that you are choosing to do this and if you don't like it you don't have to stay with it um and that is 100 percent okay too show me a permanent state of the self mom like <laughs> it's just a phase mom i, I guess i guess my 
I hope you didn't miss. Or I didn't misspeak and say that I don't think that gender expression should happen. No. I just don't think it should be a conversation that is being constantly had at the level of like statewide legislature, at the level of like there's there's so much like push to like enact laws and like to me it's like there should kids should be allowed to show up to school and be whoever they are. And then and if that is gender expression for some of them, you know, when you hit the teenage years, that's definitely going to be a big part of it. My third grader does not need to be being told like what their gender is by somebody else. Like no. that is that's then that's the problems that I'm hearing a lot of is there's so many like of these conversations happening whenever they should be learning how to, you know, add fractions. It's like that's what you're at school for. They should be learning how to how to play in the, you know, outside and share. Let you know, it doesn't matter if it's a boy, a girl, a trans, a both, a it shouldn't matter. You should be learning how to just get along with people. And then gender should come along later on because we are all, we are all just existing in these human husk. And, you know, until you're 10, 12 years old, there shouldn't be any sort of sexuality like tied to that whatsoever. But I know that we do, but I know that it's not the kids doing that. It's the adults who were involved putting that on the children. And that's what, that's what makes me really sad. I mean, yeah, like it is a really, really sad and like scary and it's almost a pathetic thought that you have all of these lawmakers that are sitting up at night, pure foaming at the mouth, wondering what I have in my pants. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, why it really do you does. Care? And honestly, and it sounds like sinister, but it is in fact like a pretty common playbook. These people are not concerned about the safety of kids. No. It's a wedge issue because if you legislate for children, the next legislative round is going to be information and legislation targeted at adults. And then targeted at women specifically. It's a suite of bills that all go together and they target children because children are good targets for this sort of thing. Right. They don't have a voice. They don't have agency. They can't talk back at you if you're saying you're defending them. And the parent lobby is weak. Like it yeah. is a political calculus and it's a horrifying political calculus, but we have been down this road before. Yeah. I can see that uh, maybe maybe I'm misreading it, but I feel like a a, a tragic sadness like just overwhelm you right now. You want to talk to speak to that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, so tragic sadness for this. Like I was actually uh, looking at the corner of my screen. I got an email notification with a news headline and it was talking about uh, the tragic death of next Benedict. Mm -hmm the Owasso student who died tragically of suicide um, yeah. in February and thinking about the fact that it was active legislative choices, like the ones we were just discussing that in like truth caused their death. Like that kiddo should still be here with us. And they are not because legislation passed that made it okay for people to hurt them to death. And that should not have ever been allowed. And it has been. And we are sitting here and we are debating about it. LGBTQIA plus suicide hotlines in Oklahoma have gone up 230% in the past month. Like wow. calls. Is that, is that, how long ago did the legislation pass? I, I don't, I am very much out of political stuff because it's, it's too much. <laughs> Respectfully. Yeah. And like, that is an incredible prov privilege that you have to be able to check out. Like mm -hmm. I can't because it's like, oh, <laughs> turns out they made it legal to hunt trans people in the streets today. Gosh, didn't realize that one would pass. Well, and you know, it's, it is both it is both a privilege and also a like choice because they've been hunting black people for my entire life, and it's just like the the hunt persists. Oh, for sure, yeah. Whether I you know whether I'm political or not, there's not a lot I could do. So it was just it was that I'm going to try to make change doing what I do and doing what I can control because I'm not going to be a politician. Like that's never that was never going to be it for me. But mm -hmm. I can try to like touch hearts and change minds. And so I'm just going to focus on what I can do. Oh, absolutely. And you're doing a wonderful thing with this. Like, do not get me wrong. It just mm -hmm. so happens that, like, by making a stink right now with these particular ones, you can do a lot with not a lot. Mm -hmm. Go, tell, tell me more. So 
we have people who are actively protesting. They are actively making their voices heard. There's support going on. And like, you have the ability to step up and say, no, this isn't right. This is not a thing that I want to have happen. And these conversations, if you are engaged and you're talking, I don't think a legislator should be able to pass an anti-trans bill without hearing that they are incorrect from all of their constituents and all of the constituents who care. That is an open floor. That is your mm. space. That is your legislator. Own it. What exactly is the legislation that, that is being passed? Like, once again, I stay out of the politics as much as possible. I knew that there was something going around, but like, please enlighten so me. There, yeah, you're good. There are like 53 separate pieces of legislation, um, all at active stages of being confirmed, disconfirmed, um, and in different spots in the process. Um, so 53 were introduced, I think, currently at this point in the legislative session, which only lasts for a couple of months. Uh, we have 13 still active. I haven't checked my legislative tracker this morning. Um, there are ones that ban trans children from playing on sports teams that aren't, uh, they're assigned gender at birth. And that one's a little bit funky. There are a number of ones targeting health care. There are ones that require school counselors and people to out uh, students who come out to them, to their parents, regardless of whether or not Yikes. their parents are supportive or not. And that's a breach of confidentiality. Yeah. Uh, there are the standard uh, like refusals of access to medical care. So right now, the big conversation is puberty blockers, and it's because people don't understand how puberty blockers work. Like... We've been using it for precocious puberty for cis children for over 80 years, but completely fine effect. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't change, like, scientifically, if you put it into the body of a trans child between a cisgender child. Like, it's the same biological process. But no. So um, a number of those. Uh, there are some bathroom bills that popped up again uh, that make it so that you cannot use your... Uh, a bathroom in public unless it's one from your assigned gender at birth which predictably leads to people who look a little bit not woman enough or a not enough man getting harassed in bathrooms shout mm. out to you next benedict that's it's so it's so confusing because i i don't care who's in the bathroom with me like i to me it would be much easier to just have bathrooms and put everything in stalls and then just be done with it then everybody can use every bathroom and the lines are all the same. Like, whatever. Like, having a stand-up stall is nice, but it's also awkward as fuck. Like, it's not something that I'm like, if they get rid of my stand-up stall, the ur my, my urinal, if they get rid of my urinal, then I'm going to be up in arms. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I don't need that to... It is nice to be able to get in and out of the bathroom faster than the, the line at the women's. Sure. But if it meant that nobody, there would be no more argument about who's using what bathroom, the kids wouldn't be getting beat up and bullied because, and that happens anyways, like before this transgender conversation was even a thing, that was even a thing that was publicly had whenever I was in school, you know, 20 years ago, people were still getting bullied in the bathrooms and it should just be a safer place where there's like, I don't know, less complex i feel like if if boys and girls were in the same bathrooms whenever i was in school there wouldn't have been bullying happening in there because girls would have been like oh gross like you're you're playing in the bathroom just get out like just just get out. and then that would have solved a lot of the problem it's just like let them like they will they'll fix a lot of the problems by themselves if you just leave them alone and the thing is it's not about the bathrooms it's about controlling access to public space yeah because if you don't have the ability to use the bathroom in public, where are you going to go? Oh, nowhere. Like, if you can't be safe. Like, are you going to just hold it for however long? Are an you, like, what are you going to do? An entire school day. An entire like, school day. Once. It is forced barring from being in public life by using a necessary human function. 
So if, if you were in school in this situation, would this have affected you negatively? Because you you're you're trans, correct? Mm-hmm. And but you were trans. Sorry, it gets it's. T- tell me how this would have affected you. That's the question I want to know. No, you're good. So probably it would not have like affected me terribly, uh, because once again, very visibly femme, and you know, for the sake of using the bathroom, like the lesser evil is just pretending and getting my business done. Like if that makes sense, I. It's it's a double edged sword, like passing in c- society. Yeah. Like on the one hand, it's like you don't have any of your experiences validated and you don't exist as a real person. But on the other hand, you're less likely to get hate crimes. So like on the balance. I, I, I understand that very well, because that is basically the life I lead as a intelligent black man, a, like a, a educated um, presenting black man. Like mm-hmm. being able to speak the language of white people allows me to get away with so many more things than if I didn't. So I, I definitely understand that struggle. Um, but I, I guess it's, I don't know. It's so like, there's, there's so, it's so expansive. Like now that this, this can of worms has been opened, it's just, it's such a big thing mm-hmm. that is, yeah. And it's, it's hard because, so the other question I wonder is because of my views on thinking that like at a young age, you should not be identified by your gender, whether it, you know, with your gender or your sexuality. Cause I think that 13 year olds don't have the capacity to make good decisions. Like they just don't like all of us when we were 13, we're making some dumb decisions. So the idea of permanently changing your human body as it progresses, like that terrifies me. So I am like, I'm genuinely concerned. And like, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on that. You ever put your kids in dance? Um, no, our kids Ballet? were in jujitsu for a little bit. But. Okay, cool. So um, I was a martial artist for like a really, really long time. I did it for mm-hmm. eight years. I had my black belt. I ended up being the first AFAB woman to receive a belt in my system. My growth plates are permanently fucked. Like permanently. I wake up in the morning and I sound like you were pouring a bowl of Rice Krispies and like coconut milk. It is like the morning snap crackle pop symphony. I was 13 when I started martial arts. Nobody asked me or told me, hey, this is permanently going to change your body and it's going to alter how you work. You don't look at kiddos who start ballet at the age of two or three and tell them that they're permanently disfiguring their bodies because now they can't stand in any way that's not a full turnout because your hips grow to accommodate that. Same thing with kiddos who do jujitsu, kiddos who do football. There is nothing you can do in this life that is not going to alter your body. Fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. And it's an unfair comparison to make just because it's different. And like for trans healthcare, for kids under the age of like 18 or to like their natural, uh, uh, biological majority. So like, when they would normally start puberty. Mm-hmm. The healthcare is you give them puberty blockers, which is the same thing you would do for any kid entering precocious puberty. And the only thing that does is allow you to have a body that fits you while you make those decisions. And then after that, you consult with your doctor, you consult with your medical team, and you figure out what your medical options are after that point. But like nobody is doing surgery on trans kids at most. It's a social transition. You cut your hair, you buy different clothes, you use a different name. I mean, but I, I, I've i seen that there, there are some who experience like they do the, the binding. They, um, you know, and that does like it does create a permanent difference. Like I'm not once again, I don't I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it or you should do it. But it is. Let me let me back up. I think that it's important to to recognize that it is a good point that doing anything does affect the body long term. There's a reason like my son didn't play football because as much as I love football, once I learned this is a thing that is going to pos- like probably affect the way that he is able to think, live, walk, talk, breathe for the rest of his life. I can't make that decision as a parent and do that to my son long term. 
even though like I think he'll love it right now. I think he'll be great at it. But I was like, as a parent, I have to make a better decision for his long term safety. That's what kind of parent I am. So mm-hmm. if if one of my children was to say, like, you know, I think that this body is not the one I belong in, I would say, OK, let's let's have some conversations. And whenever it came to I feel like I need to take a medication, I would I would be at pause. I would be very concerned. But if like I like I never even heard of puberty blockers before. So this is a brand new because once again, cisgendered male had no yeah. had no need of that. But if it were like basically it, it stops you from getting big boobs and does it like slow your period down or anything like that or so like what it will do is like stop all of like the puberty changes and it's a mm-hmm. thing that you would give because like precocious puberty happens your endocrine system is a joke largely um mm-hmm. for humans in like biological development so what it does is it is an androgen blocker basically so it slows down like all of the puberty things so whatever your secondary sex characteristics would be for your hormonal like expression it stops that and like generally you give puberty blockers till about 16 17 and that's when you can legally make consent about other medical procedures anyway Mm -hmm. and um like I don't think for me it would have made much of a difference, but there are a number of people who found puberty to be remarkably awful. And in fact, you see suicide rates for trans kiddos peak right up Mm -hmm. on those. Because if you think about it, it's the worst kind of body horror that is happening. This is a body that you don't fit in, that you know yourself well enough to know. This doesn't feel right because like children like are not becoming human they're human already like they you know yourself well you know it doesn't fit even if you don't have the words and you are having something happen to your physical form that you cannot control that no matter what you do you can't stop it doesn't matter if you want it you don't necessarily understand it it's often painful it's often uncomfortable it doesn't feel affirming at all and it's carrying you further in the direction that you you feel like is wrong for you Okay. It's like, you know that scene from Alien? There's a lot of scenes. Which one? Like, where it's, like, bursting out of his chest. Yeah. Your first period is a bit like that. Mm. In terms of, like, sheer violation and, like, incongruity with your experience. No. Oh. Like, why would I put somebody who I love and care about through, essentially, four years of, like, the worst saw shit I can think of? Mm. And then say, you know what? I'm doing this to you because I love you and because I don't trust you to make choices. Interesting. So, yeah, and I think that the the difference in knowing, like, you know, the more you know, knowing is half the battle, all that stuff. It's it's definitely true. Like, I, my understanding of being medicated for, you know, for a trans teen Mm -hmm. was was taking hormones for a, a... female who wants to transition to a male or taking estrogens for a, you know, for the opposite. And if it is in fact, just an androgen blocker, I think that is a, like, let's, let's put a pause on this thing. And, you know, and it is not any, from what I know about the, the hormonal system, having less of either, like might, might affect the way that you grow like height wise. But I don't know if you're, if you're having a, a massive body dysmorphia anyways, maybe it would probably be worth it to, to lose a couple inches off the top if you're able to like settle into your body and figure some things out. So like Yeah. And like the health for all gender affirming surgeries and procedures, the rate of discontent is 1%. Wow. 1%. The rate of discontent for a knee replacement is 36. Interesting. I I've never I've never heard it put in in comparison to like a a surgery that you have because you've been injured versus I mean and that's that's funny because it is kind of an injury to your like to your soul is what it what it sounds like. It's an injury to your dignity often. Mm. Damn. It's deep. I mean, yeah, and you have this intersection with it, with your own neurodiversity. And all of these things exist in a nexus when you're trying to exist authentically in the world around you. Because moving through professional life, I have all of these things in the back of my brain, in addition 
to like the ADHD and the autism, and I still have to function professionally at a high level so that all of my world things can go and so that I can afford rent and so that I can do this. So it's like this constant balancing beam of like existing in society in a like form that does not fit super well into society. So I think this is the last question I'm going to ask about your body because I feel like I've talked about your body for entirely too no, long. No, you're good. <laughs> it's a um, good one. I'm partial to it. Good. I'm glad you like your body. Um, <laughs> that sounded weird too. But if I like, if I were to meet you and be a single person who saw you and was like, oh, I like your physical form and started to talk to you based on that. Would that be something that in in this situation you were like, oh, I am open to that? Or are you, are you, does that make you feel gross? Do you want somebody to only like you for what is inside? I, and now this is just me completely curious because I, I have no idea. Well, like, no, it's nice to be told I'm hot in general. Like, uh, dig that. Um I, I grew them myself. Like, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, generally, it's not, I don't think of myself in a gendered way until someone else does it. And it's always just interesting to see what they'll come out with. Hmm. If that makes sense. Um, I don't expect people on the street to just like, know by looking at me that they would need to approach me in a, a different way that's not a realistic expectation um and like people who are genuinely kindly flirting with me and like responding to me on a physical level like that's great top tier thank you i i do it on purpose actually um because uh, i enjoy being attractive but um it's not necessarily a thing i think of unless you're like weird and gross dating apps are a nightmare <laughs> i can't I, for one, I can't imagine, period, because whenever I was single almost 20 years ago, dating apps weren't a thing, really. Like, there was MySpace. Um, do you know what that is? I do. I do know what MySpace <laughs> that's, is. That's, that is. That was my closest thing to a dating app. And that is not what you guys are dealing with. So I can't, <laughs> I cannot imagine. And sometimes, like, you know, there there's brief moments of like, man, I wish I would have gotten it. But then I'm like, no, I don't. Like, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of the insanity. It's a hellscape. You don't yeah, want it. I don't want that smoke at all. And, you know, that what I realized whenever I ever had those thoughts is that I wanted to escape. There was something that there was going on inside here. And generally, if I deal with that, then everything, it's uh, a phrase came up recently to me. It was, the grass isn't green on the other side. It's greener where you water it. And it's just yeah. like, so if I just like hang out where I'm at and just do like do a little self work do a little work on my marriage and I'm like, Oh yeah, everything is really good right here. Like I definitely don't want to go try to plant a whole new yard in a, like you said, in a hellish landscape that is very confusing. <laughs> like that sounds no fun. No fun and, at like, all. It's interesting because you can see who's going to respect you and who's not based on the boundary you put there where you, you say, wow, thank you so much for the compliment. Actually, my pronouns are these, please use them. And uh, if they choose not to be respectful of that, like really, really easy to accommodate boundary, it's an easy thing to be like, oh, dodged a bullet. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much for your application. That's um, nice. And you can mosey on, but like, it's a whole new factor. Um, I have so many creative ways people have asked me, like, what my bits are in this context. Just like a list. Because you can, you get those people who don't want to be rude, but they like develop the world's weirdest euphemisms. You're like, I didn't know you could put those words together in a sentence for English. And you have. Man, I guess, I guess I just assumed, like, yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even realize that whenever I think of trans, like I no longer start to think about bits and body parts. I think about like identity. And mm -hmm. so like you you were trans and that's like the fluidity is what is important to you. And like, so I never even considered the parts are, like, are the parts female presenting? Or are they not? Is that, is that the way to ask that? Is that, I don't know. I mean, I generally prefer people not to ask after my bits because I haven't decided if it's any of your business yet. 
Fair. Fair, fair, Like, fair. the jury's out. Um, <laughs> you're not improving your odds by asking weird right. questions like that. Would you just walk up to a stranger and be like, hey, so uh, you're awful cute. What do you have in your pants? I, I don't know. Right? I think... I think at this point, if I were dating, I probably would. Like, I'd be like, I, let's let's save us both some time. Like, I like the parts to, like, the, the A part to go in the B part. You know, like, I understand that whenever there is, like, men, like, homosexual men dating, it's a, like, a conversation that has to happen is like, are you a top or are you a bottom? Like, that's, it's a question that's awkward as fuck, but it's, if you want to, like, pursue a relationship down the road... And that's something that is like, I mean, it's kind of important to know. And I'm like, I don't know. Is that, is that incorrect? I mean, I think that the focus on that as an aspect, like really, really precludes people from forming genuine relationships with humans who are gender non-conforming because the world of that kind of interaction is so much wider than you'd ever expect it to be. And if you stop focusing on like your initial reaction and you expand out, I think you're going to have a much better time in general. Mm. Um, and like, because you also have to deal with the fact that there are people who are fetishistic about your gender non-conforming body. And do mm. you want to spend your time with somebody who looks at you like you're a fetish? Ooh, yeah, that's interesting. And that it's... goes back to like neurodiversity too. Like that is a common thing that impedes dating and that type of thing. Um, Wait, what is a common thing? Like neurodiversity as a fetish? Yeah. Is that a thing? Yes. Oh, my guy. Yeah. Well, once again, I've been I've been married for fifteen years. No, you're good. Like, <laughs> so, like, and uh, the idea of like intellectual disability and like having autonomy in that sphere, like, what can you consent to? What can't you consent to? What's oh my God. What's not? Ah, uh, ah! Uh, I do not want to date. Like, so, and both. <laughs> Both my wife and I have found out late stage that we're autistic. Like, this is mm -hmm. something that has been, I, I look at my wife now and I'm like, yep, I see that. I look at myself and in certain situations, I'm like, oh, yep, I see that. But I never, like, it wasn't a conversation that was had early on. And now, like, it's, I try not to think about it in that type of way because, like, I chose her because she was the one that I chose and she chose me that I was the one that I was chose. But if I have that conversation with myself, I was like, if I had known, would it be different? And I don't know. I mean, I can never know. But it's really... Like, how many times have you encountered, like, this picture of autism? And it is an autism mom standing behind their child who doesn't have any kind of agency. And the idea of that child going out and having a fulfilling relationship is, is obscene. Yes, absolutely. Like, the love on the spectrum uh, special of documentaries mm -hmm. on Netflix... Like, so many people watched it, and they watched it because it's like, oh, look at the freaks getting to date, finally. Right, right. And, like, the idea that they could be full humans with, like, a full set of human interests and capacities and the ability to engage in, like, this aspect of human behavior is just completely gone because they are unpersoned by their disability. Yeah, it's... I mean, I guess because it... Um, it the momentum grew so fast for me. I forgot that the world moves so slow. Yeah. Like, it's just like, so it's like, I, you know, once I understood that not only that autism was not what I thought it was at all for one, because like I had an autistic cousin who was like, excuse me, like level three autistic. That was like, you know, I never saw him, but like whenever I did see him is like, he was like high needs. Like that was what I, that, that was what autism was. That's all mm -hmm. I knew. And that was my picture of it until you know, 20 years later, and then I had to redefine my entire worldview. And then I just did that. And I was like, okay, autism is, it is like, you know, it's like skin color, or it's like, you know, it's like, it's something that defines the body that you're in to a degree, but it also is something that can be so much more than what you, what it is defined as. Like, so anyways, I'm, I'm getting a little off topic. No, you're good. <laughs> like, that was really, really insightful and really deep. It exists on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Just like so many of these other things. Like, the human expression and the human experience cannot be made binary. Either in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, or in terms of neurodiversity. Yeah. Like, it all exists in a spectrum. Because I had a similar relative growing up. Um, he was a ward of my aunt. 
He is in his early 50s now, and he has extremely high support needs. And I grew up assisting in his care. And that is what autism was for me. That mm -hmm. was that man, because I'm not I'm not going to use his name right now. And he does not need no. that kind of anything. But yeah. like, and it's wild to see. Because he and I will react to the same things. The only difference is I mask more. Right. And when he is disruptive, he has his autonomy taken away. Because he can't wash himself. He doesn't get to pick what he has for dinner anymore. Right? Like, the idea that if I had more needs and more visible needs, what kind of autonomy would I sacrifice? Would I be allowed to work in my office job? Because I did not disclose that I had this when I was hired. I mean, did you know when you were hired? I liked being employed. And well, and it's, it's funny because like I, dec I disclose it on everything now. It's like, you know, do you, do you have a disability? I'm like, yes, I'm ADHD. And then more recently, it's like, if they were to ask, I'd say I'm autistic and like, I don't give a shit because I also don't want to work in like in their world. Like I'm applying for jobs because if I find the one that is willing to hire me as I am and is some kind of work that I want to do, then sure. I'd love to work with them. But otherwise I just want to keep trying to, you know, like, you know, plot away at my own business and do it this way because I'd much rather make very little money doing what actually serves my soul and allows me to be myself than go back to like sacrificing who I am to the to the degree I was doing it before. It was Oh, lot. that is so fair. I have found that it is much, much easier to um tell a little bit of Wendy on the front end and then request accommodations after you're hired and the firing process is significantly longer than the hiring process right. than the reverse. Yeah. I, like I that, agree. Employers aren't your friends. Do what you need to do to be hired and then fight for your accommodations on the back end. And is, I, think, I think that's a really important statement for, especially the neurodivergent community is that we, we find ourselves wanting to serve everybody else to such a high degree that we are willing to throw ourselves under the bus and not do what needs to be done. Whenever like they are you, they're using you. You are an employee, you are a worker, you are whatever it is they are hiring you to do. They are using you and that's fine because they're paying you for it, but also they're using you. So remember that whenever you're like, why well, they need to know everything. It's like, well, which Maybe is also not. a difficult thing with like autism when you're applying for jobs because the assumption is, well, they asked for this information. They need the information. Why would I lie? Well, you see. And I, I think that it's really, uh, you know, you, you've showed me that there is a lot of different ways to like to handle that situation and to like show up. But like what I try to help the people I coach understand is that there, there is a way to exist in this life be if you are able to like decide what's actually important to you and keep focused on like the result versus trying to like meet every like thing that comes up along oh, the way. Absolutely. It's like, if my result is that I want to be, you know, this kind of person who is able to like chase their dream of being a musician, but I need to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. So I need to have a job that allows me to do this, this and that. So I need to get that job. Mm -hmm. And whenever I whenever I apply for that job, I need to I need to give the relevant truth. Is my ADHD dis like disabling in a way that will affect this job? Probably not. So I'm like they don't necessarily need to know that because I need to support myself first. Yeah, like it is one of those things, and I I think I talked about it the last time you and I sat down. Uh, the phrase "go out softly and come home safe." Mm -hmm. It works for my trans friends. It works for my neurodivergent friends. Like there is no shame and it is not a sacrifice to your authenticity for you to do the things that you need to do to survive. If you need to mask, if you need to appear differently than you are, if you need to present yourself in a way that feels inauthentic, the important thing is that you come home safe. Yeah. Everything else after that is gravy. Like, genuinely. And it's appalling that we have to think like this. Um, and I really, really hope it won't be like this forever. But we got to make it there first. So, go out soft, yeah. come home safe. So, something I was going to, like, I was kind of thinking about asking you, or talking about after, is like, but I because of that, I'm like, I need to talk about it now. If it's something, if it's a question or a feeling of a conversation I need to have 
period. I just, I just need to have it. It's like whenever we were talking about bits and parts, like I, I had, I kind of framed it in a way that suggested that if it was a certain way, I wouldn't pursue that. And something that I've like the knowledge I've gained of myself over the last five to 10 years is that I don't know that anymore. Like I used to like for, there was a brief period in high school where I considered maybe I should just be gay because like, I thought it was a choice like that. But what I, what I hate, just like I hated girls, it's like girls are just annoying. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with them anymore. Also, once again, I was not able to do any work on myself at that time. Cause I was a little boy, but now as a grown adult, I understand like I've had so much programming as to what is supposed to be sexy what is supposed to be sexual what is supposed to be this and that what a woman is supposed to be all these programmings that i have that now like i am trying to uncouple all those things and learn like what it is to like for one like a person for being a person like mm -hmm. enjoy somebody's personage without making them a sex object that is the one battle and then it is to like on the opposite end understand that there is like a sexuality that that belongs and that is and has nothing to do with the physical body there's like there's this really complex thing that i like i don't have to understand too much because luckily i am married and i'm in a very happy sexual relationship but i don't want to come off like now if i found out that this person that i was interested in had different parts i would be like okay peace because i don't think that's true anymore like, I think that I'm, I'm a different person who has evolved enough to say, like, OK, I don't know what that means to me, but like, I'm glad you shared it with me. And I need to like I need to be break, uh, be cautious moving forward because this is new territory. And that's I think that's the way I would have that conversation outside yeah. of all the other things that are happening on the dating apps as you're talking about. But that's, you know. Yeah, like, and that's an incredibly mature way to go about it because you don't know what you don't know about yourself until you mm. know. And like, it's not a bad thing. And like, that is actually probably if I received that as a response would be like a solid, okay, let's go ahead. And would be like a very polite, respectful way of approaching that. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it would be one of those conversations that it's like extremely awkward to have, hard to get out, but you feel so much better. Both parties feel so much better once it's just said. It's like, hey, I don't know how I'm how I'm going to handle this because I've never done it before, but I want you to know I'm thinking about it. And yeah. it is some like I want this to be out in the open and not to be this hidden process that I'm constantly judging and I'm staring at your pants and like, what is in there? Because that, you know, you're going to come across as false. You're going to come across as like distracted or whatever, whenever you could just have the conversation and say like, I don't know how to navigate this. Like, I mean, <laughs> be aware that the person who you are talking to is likely twice as terrified as you are mm -hmm. for very good reason. Uh, the gay panic defense is in fact a thing that is used currently in 27 different states and it is a defense used in murder cases wherein the person who did the murder the murderer um is let off because the shock of finding out that the person that they killed was either gay or trans was deemed like a reasonable reason for killing them so in that space when do you have the conversation for your own safety? Well, for my own safety, it like it really depends. Like I use the vetting thing. I try really hard not to hook up with people who care that much about it because it's like a, I don't want to end up on a lifetime special sort of right. thing. Um, but you, I know people who do it on first dates. I know people who make sure to only do it over text message. That way you can just block the person and not have to like worry about, hey, am I about to get axe murdered? Right, right. So um, complex. Oh, like yeah. that's that is really like a a very and I like I'm trying to figure out how to have this conversation without seeming like I'm trying to like further determine what's in your pants because that's not like that's not <laughs> what I'm but if you're a trans woman or if you're a non-binary trans person do you still have the same fear because you're not a, you're not claiming to be either like you know there is no there is no claim as to what's in your pants like i usually i feel like oh i'm non bond i'm non-binary that conversation comes super early it's like that is something that is said so and then from there i feel like the assumption of what's in your pants is it is it could be anything 
you're you're choosing to like date the unknown at this point. And if you were dating a non-binary person and you act surprised whenever there's anything there, then you you were lying to yourself. Like, so I feel like there would there would be less fear in that axe murderer situation than if you are one you are trans gender to one sex or the other. I mean, it really, really depends. I pers like I am not a person who speaks for the entirety of the trans experience right, or the non-binary right, experience. Uh, for me, it's not really that much of a fear, personally. Um, I don't like their odds, first and foremost. And second of all, like, I usually just deflect it with a joke. The common phrase is, it can be whatever you want. Like, they, they make shops for this. Right. Like, what are you into? We We can work it out. Is there a is there a sense of uh sadness in that joke like that that you have to defect that with humor like you know you talked about the world that you want versus the world that you're living in and is that like is it hard to have to make that type of joke versus like you know I don't know like I feel like that joke is it's sad yeah it's, it's sad. it like, very it, much is like um so I think of humor and of hope and of joy like a discipline these things are cultivated and these things are intentional um i can choose to be in constant agonizing horror at the world around me because there's lord knows there's enough pain to go around for that um and if you spend too long thinking about it and focusing only on that uh, you're not going to do anything. You're going to curl in a ball and cry. Mm -hmm. um, however, hope, joy, discipline, these things, this humor, these are weapons. You don't get to take that from me, like the world as a whole. Like, it is a choice to acknowledge, like, the sadness and then find the humor in it. Because there's never one without the other. Because it is also, if you think about it objectively a hilarious predicament to be in oh yeah it is as it well is. and like you can focus on the horror of it or you can lean into the fact that it's objectively funny that you're having to make a strap joke mm -hmm. like okay um and it like the joy is the thing that you can't let go of because like that's the rebellion because right. they want you to be sad and they want you to think, wow, it's so awkward and terrible that I have to do this. Oh, gosh, I'm a little freak. Like, I should probably conform now because it's sad and miserable. Except no, because, like, it is a rebellion in and of itself to take this thing that people find, like, sad and turn it into something joyful and wonderful. And then that can be applied across from the trans experience to the neurodivergent experience of like, oh, I'm a little freak or, you know, owning your situation. And, you know, um, I, I strongly believe that my ADHD is more of a strength than it is a weakness. Like, yeah. I really do. Like, I feel like it has made me a much stronger person. It didn't start out that way. Like, it could have, if I had just stayed in the the dumps and the doldrums about being this ADHD kid, it would have stayed a weakness, but oh, I, absolutely. I, I learned how to lean into it and how to like train myself to like, whenever I hyper-focus, instead of like hyper-focusing on things that are a waste of time, like I, I gain new skills to add to my skill set. Like that's what I do. And yeah. that's, that's something that only happened because I decided to not be a victim to my ADHD. I think it's not even allowing yourself to not be a victim because I don't know that like, I, I hate the idea of like a victim mentality because like mm -hmm. it has such a negative connotation and it's such a reasonable response to un like unfortunate or traumatic experience. Like, yes, you have been victimized. You can claim that there is no shame or weakness in being a victim. Um, and that goes across the board for all of those things. Like it is a profound act of courage to acknowledge your own victimization. And to deal with that pain and to say, yeah, that was a thing that hurt. And it impacted me. And that's really what victimhood is, is acknowledging and giving yourself the grace to like sit in that hurt and then heal from it and be like, wow, that should not have happened to me. And I can grow. And I I, I don't disagree that there is a, 
a lot to be learned from being raw and feeling the feelings of like of whatever you were victimized by. But I feel like there is a strength in leaving the victim and in leaving that victimhood behind. And it's something that has to be done actively. Like, oh, absolutely. Choosing to like act like actually take that experience and turn it into a powerful like tool in your tool belt is something that it doesn't happen on accident. And that is, that is whenever you are able to leave that vic- the, the victim mentality behind is you are actively seeking the lesson to be learned. And if you are in that mentality, you are not going to believe that there's a lesson. You're going to say like, I didn't deserve this. So, but whenever you can change that mentality and you can realize that there's a gift in it for you and it's like, the gift may not have been worth the price of purchase, but there is a gift there. But you have like, if you don't accept it, then there's just a, this terrible experience that happened and nothing was gained. Like, so I want people who've been through, like, you know, I've been through some really awful things that I I've been pulled over in situations. Like let's, let's specifically one. When I was 10 years old, I was like put up against the wall and searched as a 10 year old for walking in like walking to the gross, the, the gas station with my brother, like the cops pulled us over for walking in the middle of the day. And we were like searched and like, you know, the cops spit in our direction and used like, maybe, like it was an experience that really shaped who I was for a long time. But what I learned from that experience was that I cannot let other people define who I am. Like that was, that was a kind of a burgeoning moment for me to come out and start defining myself was because that thing was like, people are always going to try to make assumptions about you. They're going to say, you're black. You're in a, you know, you're in this all white neighborhood. What are you doing here? It was like, I'm walking. I'm not doing anything wrong, but it still happened because people are going to make assumptions about you. And if you don't know who you are, you're going to let those assumptions become who you are. And that like, you know, I learned that because of that situation. So I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. I want it to happen again. I don't- <laughs> I don't want it to have anybody else, but there is agency in victimhood, even if there is not agency in tragedy. Yeah. I like that. Like you have the ability to choose how this defines you and you have that agency there and it is a cyclic process. There is never a point when you have graduated from victimhood and into survivorhood and you carry both things with you all the time. So Mm. I also used to work in um, interpersonal violence prevention and sexual assault prevention. Um, And that's a topic that we speak about as well, like the difference between victim and survivor and how those two things are often like the same thing all at once. Um, And like reclaiming your agency in both as a concept and like trauma functions a lot like that just across the board um, and things that are traumatic you don't even realize necessarily are traumatic because existing um, as a neurodivergent person comes with its own traumas, Mm -hmm. like piled one on top of the other. Masking is a profound trauma to do to yourself Yeah, as a whole. It's it's both a trauma response and a trauma in itself. And that is how jacked up is that? (laughs) It's cyclic because you are doing these things to survive. And at the same time, like, the things that you're doing to survive are like harmful. Mm. You, you do your best with the tools that you have available. And the only thing that matters is that you have made it here to this point, mm-hmm. like straight up, congratulations, you're here. And I'm so glad you're here. And I guess, I guess something that I always have to remind myself is like, generally my message is one that is like, it is meant to be consumed by a mass population of people, but you have been in a place where you have dealt with the people who have been the most traumatized. And like to tell them coming into one of you know the courses that you would have taught, like don't be a victim, you're not helping yourself anymore. It's probably not going to help them a whole lot. It's probably going to feel a lot like the situation they just left. So I want to, I definitely want to. I've had this conversation, not this exact one, but on another earlier episode of mine with my friend Larissa, is that the way that I present my message is not for everyone. It oh, is not. Sure. Going to, it is not going to reach everybody, but it is it is one of hope and of caring and love because I don't want anybody to be stuck in a place where they feel like they cannot help themselves. And that is like, whenever I think of the the victim mentality, that is the thing that brings the most true to me is that 
inability to change your own situation. And I think that if you're in the worst of the worst place, I'm probably not going to be the, the person you need to listen to. But if you've gotten to where you're a little bit, your head's a little bit above water, then that's generally where my message is going to hit you and allow you to to climb a little higher and, you know, get your, get your upper body onto the life raft. <laughs> oh, super, super true and super fair and valid. Um, I think part of like that empowerment aspect, because like there are steps to that. And like, if you don't find yourself at a step where you can grab empowerment like that, then that is fine. You're just mm. not there yet. Yes, and exactly. Like, at all stages of reclaiming your own agency and developing empowerment in this way, it is necessary to give yourself grace. And to give yourself kindness, because I think oftentimes when we're dealing with this idea of a victim mentality, you have this notion that, well, if I were better, it wouldn't be so hard. And I thought yeah. that all the time with my ADHD, I thought I was dumb. I thought I was like struggling and all of these other people were just like better than me. And it was because I wasn't applying myself. And if I just worked harder and was just better at regulating my emotions, if I was just better in general, like I would have earned it. And I like would be able to do these things. And it wasn't until I gave myself the grace to be like, okay, this is hard and it shouldn't hurt like this. I need to consider other options that I like allowed myself to have agency because I didn't mm. even think I deserved it. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. I was sitting with a client today and um, we were digging into his self-worth like it mm -hmm. like you know he's adhd he's one of my best friends and he struggles like we keep coming back to this thing of him not feeling worthy to step up into his household and be the leader not being worthy to be the husband who actually has a say as to you know what the kids do not feeling worthy to lead his children to do this and to do that it comes back up at work to not feeling worthy to like put up boundaries and say like you can't dump all your work on me all the time but if you if you keep, if you just like stay in that space where you don't feel worthy, then you, you are never going to be able to see the fruits of the work that you're putting in. You just can't like, even if, even if you are gaining a lot of like a lot of fruit, like you're doing a lot of things that are making big changes and you know, you're making a relevant difference. You won't appreciate it because you don't, you won't feel worthy of what you're earning. And that's, mm -hmm. You know, the, the work on self-worth is probably the most important work you can do. Oh, absolutely. Like, congratulations on being a human person who is on this earth. You are worthy of, mm -hmm. like, kindness and dignity and love and respect. Yep. Like, that's you, all you have to do. That's the price of admission, babes. Where you are right now is good enough. And if you can accept that, then you'll get better. Like, that's just, like, not, not like, be fixed, but, like, you'll get better things. Once you accept where you are right now and you say you are good enough to have whatever you want then you can start getting whatever you want but people they they refuse to believe it it's like i will first i need to first i need to lose 30 pounds or first i need to you know i need to start talking to my mom again or first i need to fix the relationship that i was like no even if you just like fucked up majorly and have just like wrecked your marriage or whatever like you still are worthy to be here. You still are worthy to exist. You're still worthy of love. You're still worthy of growth. You're still everything. You still deserve everything, but you just yeah. have to, you have to allow yourself to have it. So I also like, that is a very, very similar message to one of the things that I talk about extensively with substance abuse prevention and specifically harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, there is nothing you can do there is no substance you can take. There is no path you can go down. There is no mental illness you can have that will ever make you not a person. Not a person worthy of dignity. There is nothing that you can do to yourself that will remove the inviolate, inherent worth that you have as a person. And you are a person who deserves help, who deserves kindness, who deserves respect, and you deserve it first and foremost from yourself if you can do it. And if you can't, that's okay because you still deserve it. Yeah. Like there is not a point that you stop being worthy of care. And like where there's breath, there's hope. Uh, I say this when I uh, give out syringes to people and do syringe exchanges, uh, when I hand out crack pipes to people who are in active use because they deserve to be safe. Mm -hmm. Like 
and it goes back. Um, our lines of oppression run parallel. Um, and experience is called to one another. Like your experience of oppression as a person with neurodiversity is similar to a, a person with oppression uh, with substance use disorder. Like there are similar things where we assume the lack of agency is like a choice instead of like a biological thing. Mm -hmm. And they're both things that we think willpower will improve. And like, if you aren't putting in the effort and the willpower, you don't deserve my help. And that is not the case. I'm, willpower is something that came up recently that I'm like, I'm, I don't know what willpower used to mean. And I don't know what it meant to me, but like, I've always said I've, I've had terrible willpower, but like I've recently, like I have taken control of my life and I've started to do things that, you know, it's like, I've built my own business. I've, you know, went out and got clients. I have started to do like habits every single day that I would have told myself two years ago, I couldn't do because I'm ADHD. I think that it's not willpower. It's the ability to form a plan and like have a vision and like be compelled by it. Mm -hmm. Like once I was able to like actually paint myself a compelling vision and just, com just be committed to working my way, however, slowly towards it, like that changed everything for me. And a lot of people think that they're just going to start doing the thing. It's like, I'm just going to lose this weight. Okay. Why? I, because I, I want to be less fat. And it's like, yeah, that's not really a compelling future. Like that's just na It's like trying to negative self-talk yourself into like doing something and it might work on the short term, but it's not going to be a lasting transformation because there is not rooted in anything that actually really matters to you. It's like society's guilt that has made you want to do it. Like, I don't want to, like, I used to want to be a skinnier person because I hated my body because it's not what I thought society wanted. And so yeah. whenever I, when, even whenever I lost a bunch of weight and I was the most muscular I've ever been, I hated my body because it still wasn't this, this illusory thing. Now I want my body to be functional. I want to be able to pick my kids up. I want to be able to help around the kids and be an active leader. Those are the things that are like drawing me forward. So I don't need to go obsessed in the gym for three hours and still hate myself in the mirror. Like as long as I'm able to like slowly improve and get more flexible and, you know, let, then I'm, then I'm, I'm going to be more and more fulfilled because that's the vision. Like the vision is to be like able to be completely present as a father and that's that moves me forward every single day versus trying to just push myself through and just like just just brute force it just willpower like no that doesn't like, work the thing is willpower works completely differently for people who are neurotypical and neurodivergent because you don't get a dopamine bump when you complete things also yeah. your executive function is in the shitter you don't have the ability to plan ahead because you literally do not have the ability to picture that you can't see the end when you're starting. All you see are little tasks that are all equally big tasks because you don't have the ability to prioritize and you don't even get a little dopamine bump at the end of this. It's just a grueling and kind of exhausting task and you can't see the end. And like that makes it super hard to plan for things and super hard to hold things in your mind and super hard to develop the executive function to get through that. Like I frequently am so aware of this and I have to like, build in actual accommodation steps wherein I like plan okay this is the chunk and this is what it's going to look like and I like call in other people because I'm like okay I can't see where I'm going I don't know how I'm gonna do this and like this is a big task for me and I can't break it out into little things please help I have an app on my phone that is a to-do list thing and it will AI generate like the individual steps if I'm is stuck. It, is it goblin tools? It is goblin tools. <laughs> How do you say your ADHD without saying your ADHD? Goblin tools. <laughs> goblin tools. And it's brilliant. And like you have to break it apart and do those things. And you have to be so, so kind to yourself while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Like it is and not a victim mentality to be like, you know what? This is hard. I frequently have to gentle parent myself where I'm like, oh, Buddy, that is a big emotion. Do you need yeah. a snack and to go nap, nap? Because you're you're not acting normal right now. Well, and then you know, as a as a life coach, that's what what you're talking about is what I do. It is like asking for help 
to me is the it is the bravest thing that you can do oh yes it, it is the first step into trying to like trying to create that compelling future it's saying i can't do this by myself like i cannot i cannot see the compelling future i cannot make the plan i can't do it by myself and that's okay like that is like that is the biggest thing to have grace for is like admitting that you can't do it on your own and then you're like oh, i know that's the 12 step program that's substance <laughs> abuse that but it is it, it is the secret sauce it is like just submitting to the to the fact that you were born imperfect you are a human we have faults and one of those faults is often or one of those faults is always we are not equipped to solve the problems that we created like no. we we just aren't until you expand your capacity it, either through learning some sort of like unfortunate trauma or by asking for help is the only way that you are able to learn how to solve a problem that you created and it just if once you understand and admit that like a whole new future opens up for you i think and like this is a biologist talking about this i think that like the truest biological human nature is asking for help as infants it is the first and only thing we can do mm -hmm. do you know how rare it is in the animal kingdom to have infants who make noise that is absolutely antithetical to the idea of how you care for most infants in the wild you want them quiet yeah. so that bigger predators cannot come up and eat them mm -hmm. you come out of the womb screaming for help and you are attuned biologically to recognize the sounds of infants crying wow that is what you do. The first thing we prioritize millions and millions and millions of years of evolution have led to you coming out and asking for help as the baseline thing for your survival. We form communities and we form societies, and that is our evolutionary advantage. You are not meant to live alone. You're not meant to do things by yourself. You are meant to do things in community. It is everything that your biology instructs you to do. Damn, that was deep. That was good stuff. Yeah. I really like that. Well, I think this is, I feel like that's a good wrapping up point. We're right at a little, a little under an hour and a half. Um, let's talk a little bit about resources. Like you are, you have got so much stuff at your disposal that would help the ADHD neurodiverse community. And so please share away. What do you think this audience needs to hear about? Like, it's yours. Go. Okay. So the first one I'm going to talk about, and this is like a little bit of a shameless and selfless plug is 988. It is the mental health helpline. It's national. Uh, here in Oklahoma, the response time is 96 seconds and you will be connected to somebody who is licensed and can help you. So if you're sitting there and you are struggling and you're having a bad time of it, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be a crisis, you can call for other people. You can get connected to other resources like that. 988 at your fingertips free 24 7 always available for you um that was I'm not also... shameless and it was not a plug you absolutely <laughs> you don't get paid specifically to answer that phone call so this is not a plug Fair like, enough. You, thank you i for do sharing not that. i am not going to be on the other end of 988 i'm just like really <laughs> excited about it that's awesome um i'm also going to say uh oh goodness what other resources do we have um there's 211. If you are ever in need of actual, like, physical, oh no, I need these resources, please call that. We know that our neurodivergent friends and family often have higher rates of poverty and eviction and all sorts of other things, and you are regularly need, in need of resources. 211. Um, also, get familiar with your local ADA. You deserve accommodations if you want them, they're yours. Go take them. Um, the Autism Self Advocacy Network is also a thing. Um, nothing about us without us. They have chapters all over and they have resources for employment. They have resources for advocating for yourself in school. They have all sorts of other things. And I just think everybody should be a part of them. Um, and also fuck Autism Speaks. Just genuinely from why? the bottom of my heart. Tell me why. I don't know why. Oh. Um. It, you're not going to be happy hearing about it, but um, so Autism Speaks is essentially a hate group. Um, the focus is on curing autism, uh, you know, mm. like a eugenicist. Uh, they are fans of ABA therapy, you know, like eugenicists. Um, 
so it's uh they're run mostly by autism moms primarily it's not for autistic people it's to autistic people they're uh they were fans of the bleach enema you know what? to cure your autism i haven't done my autism research because like i said i've only been diagnosed or self-diagnosed for about six months so it's wow well I'm going to say that if anybody is listening to this and they want to do their own research on it, I'm going to suggest that you take B and make sure that that's a thing that you want to go and look at. Um, and like you have some happy videos at the other end for you for self-care. Wow. Uh, engage in that research responsibly, please. Damn. I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. Fair. That's very fair. Just know that every single time you see one of those, uh, Puzzle piece fucks. They are not for you. I, and I will take your word on it because you are very well researched and you are very well informed. And sometimes you got to trust the people. You don't ask. Uh, you don't ask how can I. You ask who can I. And so yeah, it's very fair. In this uh, situation, if you want more Bales research, is the person. <laughs> yeah, like, and I'm a firm believer in things that give you back your agency. Um, and Autism Speaks doesn't have anyone who's actually autistic on the board. Damn. Yeah, like, thank you for making my decisions for me. Okay. Anyways, but sorry, no, I so autism, you uh, No, you're good. Autism Self Advocacy Network, ASAN. Uh, fantastic tool there. Um, and I guess Bruce Alexander's Living Authentically on Air is a great resource <laughs> for people who are trying to learn more about how to live authentically with ADHD and other neurodiversity things. Well, thanks for that plug. I appreciate that. I got gotcha. you. It has been a fantastic conversation. And thank you for being so vulnerable and open about both your ADHD and your gender and sexuality. Yeah. It's been a lot. I mean, it's been a lot. We went there. Like, we went all you know, over. All over the place. It was definitely an ADHD conversation, <laughs> but in all the best ways. And I think that there is a lot of, you know, a lot of information and insightful stuff that came out of this conversation. I definitely have learned a lot. Like, I really especially about the the gender information is stuff that I've been curious about and stuff that, you know, like I said, I didn't, have, I don't know where to ask those questions. Like that's like, who do you, who do you talk to that about without sounding like an ignorant douchebag? Like, <laughs> and like, you can in fact talk to me. Um, you can pop my contact information wherever, like if you need help, if you want resources, if you have questions, go ahead. I, uh, my shoulders are broad and I'm kind of good at answering them at this point. So go ham. <laughs> go ham. <laughs> okay. Well, so this has been Authentic on Air with Bales Chapel. Jip Chapels. Oh, damn it. There Dang we it. go. You I made it so almost halfway through. Uh, this has been Authentic on Air with Bruce Alexander with my special guest, Bales Chapels, who has been a joy to have on. And if she will hang on for just a second after we wrap here, I'll have a short conversation with, but if, you've enjoyed the episode please make sure to like and subscribe follow me on all of the platforms authentic bruce is pretty much everywhere at this point and um this has been really enriching for me if you are curious about more of my services as a life coach please go take the uh the adhd aimless life assessment at authentic identity management.com forward slash assessment and get your aimless life rating and figure out what my next steps for you to start living life on purpose are and please keep listening to the podcast as we continue to find our new legs and really continue to explore the intersection between neurodiversity and authenticity thank you so much everybody i will talk to you next time and thank you bales thank you and play live have a great night everybody i will talk to you next time bye